This episode was brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For M-Lock grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. Don't miss, bro. Ja, grüß dich, Michu hier. Ja, Michu. How is your car, Mama? Ja, gut, Messi. Was ist los? What is going on? You only have a call, wenn something is wrong. Ja, okay. I'm here in the Village Science Project Fair. Und I'm looking at your project. And the muscle looks like the drawing of the Fallschirm Jägergewehr 42 that I showed you last month. Do you know anything about this? I do not have the slightest idea what you could possibly be talking about. Even the angles look the same. Did you file a patent with our Eidgenössisches Patent Office? Well, no. Ach, schoolboy error. So sad. But... Yeah, but... What? It... Stop making ugly yet functional guns from my designs! K55, the last that we're doing on the Swiss straight pull specialty rifles. All right, well, let's start things off at 150 yards. Impact. Is it dead? Uh, yeah. All right. Slightly off, off center to the right. That one was left side. Ah, you see the elevation turrets moving again. Because there's no lock, no clicks, no nothing. It's just so, a... When we did a quick zero of this, we noticed that the turrets on the elevation on this can tend to drift. So Henry's got to keep his eye on the elevation turret to make sure that as he's shooting, the recoil doesn't cause a shift. Yeah. All right, I'm on it. 200... Impact. Windage. Look good to me. Impact. That's the neutralized shot. All right, Henry. 250. Okay. Impact. How's the elevation on that? Looks good. Neutralized. So the muzzle brake on this is very effective. It is noticeably less recoiling than, a uh, very noticeably less recoiling than uh, both the K31 and the ZFK uh, 3142. All right, we're on it, 300. Okay. 
I have to aim at the very base of these targets and the sighting, the sight uh, reticle post is indeed not pointed. It is a flat post. Impact. There's a slight difference between the other guy who's shooting, eh? Oh my gosh. Well, that's unfortunate. <sighs> okay, so that one we're not counting, right? I mean, no, because it's uh, it. it's annoying. So what happens at, right as right before I pulled the trigger, someone online shot the 300-yard target and spun it vertically, or <laughs> horizontally, uh, horizontally, to where it, it it just the target juke Henry. Yeah. Let's be honest, yeah. he got so, a little juke. A little that one was the one we killed twice. <laughs> ago, so. All right, I'm on at 350. So he's learning. Mm -hmm. Impact. Tell me that guy isn't chasing me out. <laughs> Impact. Nice, dude. All right, I'm on it. 400. All right, so you ready? Yep. Impact. Mmm, the powder burn of the GP11. Delicious. It's got a very unique smell. Yeah. It smells like the mountains uh, of Switzerland and not at all like the hot lava temperature of Texas that we've decided <laughs> to shoot every single one of these Swiss rifles in. Okay, what am I for? You are one more at four. The last one was good. Impact. All right, we're on a 450 now. Just off the left edge. Good elevation. Same exact spot, just off the left edge. Good elevation. Impact. Ready? Yep. Just off the right edge. 50. Yep. Oh, you know what just happened? Did our turrets move? Yeah, the turret moved and I wasn't paying attention. Whew. Just off the right edge. Still? All right, I'm going back to the favor left. Ready? Yep. Uh, I missed that one. Impact. Oh, I've got to get some retraining on this uh, scope, my friend. Just off the left edge. Impact. Right half. Upper right half, to be honest. Your elevation's been good, though, on all these other shots. Impact. Oh. Okay. Shall we try to take it a little bit further? Uh, it's up to you. I mean, it seems like the rifle is definitely capable and accurate. It's just a matter of finding out what these holds are. I'm having trouble, honestly, with this scope. Yeah? at that distance when I'm, I don't know, I, I don't have an issue. I don't have an issue when it comes down to using an iron sight and favoring left and right. Um, I I don't know, maybe it just takes a little bit more time to, to learn how to use the, uh, the flat based scope because it, there's no tip to it, Josh. Yeah. It, it's, it's, like, it's like this. Got it. Well, hey, let's, so look, uh, look, let's look at this. Look, look, look. You, you can look. You can look. Yeah, it's like a nubbin. Yeah. Much harder to hold the wind then. Yeah. All right, so. well, why don't we do this, Henry? Why don't we go to 650? Okay. See if we can record a hit there because I think the rifle is capable of doing it. I think it is. Let's try, let's try to get collect some hits with the five, with the five shots. Uh, 650? Yeah, let's go at 650. Ooh, 
I could see the vapor and then it kind of just shot away from me. Maybe bottom right corner. Nope. Impact. Okay. Nice. That um, was dead on. So basically, I was using, I was, I was putting the target. If this was the post, I was putting the target right here on the edge. Right. Where it was just drifting off. Oh, but sweet. Nice. I feel like I need to learn how to use the uh, that type of post system more. Uh, obviously, I'm having issues. Obviously, I'm having issues learning how the windage works with it. The other issue is that the elevation doesn't correspond to the numbers. And then the third issue is that the turret is a free spinning turret, unless this is a broken piece, which I, I don't believe it is. Um, but uh, shall we talk about this in the analysis area? Yeah, yeah. I'd say an initial immediate thanks to Ian. Yes. Uh, Huge thanks to Ian uh, from Forgotten Weapons, hallelujah. And thanks to Ian's uh, viewer, Jeff, who loaned us this rifle. Thanks to our friends at Edelweiss, who actually were the importers of the rifle and sent us some GP11 to, uh, to use, which we're trying not to blow through all of the GP11, but uh, yes. <laughs> all right, well, we'll see you guys in the breakdown segment. Yes. So the doctrine was to be able to engage individual targets out to 600 meters under normal lighting conditions and in dawn and dusk conditions out to about 300 at night against illuminated targets and uh, of course if at any time a high value target presented itself or even at longer ranges a, uh, a group target presented itself they could uh, have a pop had at them. Um, overall it's rather a more DMR type doctrine than modern sniper doctrine and the fact that it mounts a bayonet really speaks towards that as well. Um, they were used either by an individual or with a spotter, and the spotter having binoculars and uh, his personal weapon, which was a K31 or a Stronger 57 depending on the era. The shooting was mostly meant to be done off the bipod, but under certain circumstances, resting or even using the sling for support were expected. And sling support with a rifle that heavy is probably a bit optimistic for any length of time, really. The rifles were not issued as personal weapons to be taken home. Uh, the Swiss Army is a militia system and uh, people take their personal weapon home. They were core material. They belonged to the unit and were issued out as needed. The scope was expected to be removed during movement, even on the battlefield and uh, placed in its container on the belt. Uh, I think realistically, obviously they're trying to protect the scope, but putting it on and off like that all the time probably isn't practical. It's more likely to get the scope damaged or lost than just leaving it on the rifle. And if it was me, I would leave the scope on the rifle all the time in case the target presented itself. They also have a surprisingly loose definition of an acceptable zero. Uh, so that a lot of aiming off was, uh, was taught and the zero had to be quite a long way off before the scope would actually be properly re-zeroed. As for training, courses seem to have been organized mostly on an ad hoc basis at unit level, with shooting practice out to 500 meters and more snipery field craft type stuff like distance judgment, observation, use of the landscape and so on. Uh, another part of the training that leads you to, to, to realize it's more DMR type training is that at longer ranges, which they define as from 300 out, uh, they were trained to walk shots into the target based on watching the splash rather than a sort of one shot, one kill out to 600. And the muzzle brake is actually effective enough that you can do this. Um, it's a really flat shooting rifle, and, um, but the time of flight below 300 meters is, is too short for the rifle to have settled so you can actually watch the impact. So you'd need a spotter to help you with that. Ultimately, the rifles were not well liked. They were not considered particularly effective, particularly for the weight. And as a result, a bit like the uh, L86 light support weapon in British service, they were kind of treated as the crow cannon and given to the young guy to carry because uh, everyone else would rather carry something lighter. It was ultimately replaced by scoped 57s, which again points towards DMR type thinking. No, you're, okay. I just, let me get it set up for the camera, Henry. It's, I know it's a bipod, but, um... yep. It's not gonna happen, eh? 
Well, fine, I'll just hold it. Oh, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so the... Hi, guys. <laughs> Uh, the, what is this one now? ZFK55, which was which is one of the last uh, specialty straight pull Swiss straight pulls that we were featuring. Right. So, what are some of the other ones we did? In case people aren't don't remember. So we've done the Diopter Swiss K31, the standard K31. Yeah. We've also done the K3142 Sniper. Is that the one with the tiny little, the periscope? little periscope that yeah. pops off the side? Yeah. Which, I personally, that that's my favorite out of all yeah. of those. I think it's cool because, you know, the little tangent sight yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end we have the ZFK55. So is this uh, basically just this the same Swiss base rifle with a different mounting and different optics? Sort of. If you look at the ejection, it's right. cocked off to the side, so it's about at 15 a, degrees. Right. Base to the right, mm -hmm. base to the right, right. Operation-wise, it's yeah. the same, right? Uh, but even the magazine entry and everything, mm -hmm. you see, it's it's off to the side, and that's to facilitate this guy. It is a QD three and a half X scope, supposed to be bullet drop compensated to eight hundred meters. However, I, look, I don't know why it wouldn't correspond to the the turrets. Yeah, and and that's why I was having such a hard time with it. Whereas the ZFK forty two, yeah, it did it corresponded yeah, perfectly it really fine. Well. The other thing too that I heard you, you know we were talking about on range is that the elevation adjustment it's basically just a smooth wheel. For for those of you who are familiar with modern optics, this feels like a parallax adjustment mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a elevation turret adjustment. It's like binoculars at the very end, the focus wheel. Yeah. I mean yeah, there's, no, there's, no there's, like there's, there's no there's no click. There's no click. There's no even the the Mauser ninety eight mm -hmm. snipers, the ZF thirty nines, they had the little dial in the front. That was to lock the uh, turret, the elevation mm -hmm. turret. And is that is that because this specific optic is actually damaged, or is that how it's designed? Do we know? I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's how this particular model was. So multiple times then while we were shooting, there were actually times where this shifted during the shooting process and mm -hmm. caused, we can say it caused misses, but we, we're not positive that that was the sheer yeah. and only cause of a miss, but we can definitely say that it played a contributing factor to I misses. Would, I would say another thing is also the post Mm -hmm. uh, in the reticle. The, the center of the reticle is what Henry's referencing. Because it's, 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 a it's a T-shaped reticle, but right. it's different than the other T-shaped reticles. It's not a pointy tip. See. It's not a pointy tip. It's, a, it's like a fence post, if you look at Yeah, it's a rounded nub on the top. Yeah. So it's sort of like looking through the front side of iron sights, but it's not. Because... Well, even the iron sights are generally squared off. Like, yeah, don't you yeah. think that if this were squared off, it would still I have think been it would better be than easy being because rounded? That's the thing. When I use a, I, I prefer the Lee Enfield width of iron sights, mm -hmm. uh, not the American iron sights because they're, uh, the American iron sights are too thin. Uh, I like the little bit of width, which is the standard K31 mm -hmm, iron sights, mm -hmm. which the iron sights being squared and thick actually gives you an advantage if you're shooting at distance because you could use that to favor left or favor right. Right. Because uh, you, you, you can right, you can gauge your bracketing of the target a bit better. Yes. Yeah. This I had trouble doing because it's rounded off to the side. You know, that's a very similar issue to when you're trying to shoot a dot at distance. Yeah. It's not dissimilar because you're you're you've got like if you think about it, the dot is just rounded on the entirety yeah. of the thing. And it's hard to gauge exactly where in relation to the target you are mm -hmm. at all the times, you know? In fact, the break took down a lot of the recoil mm. on this compared to the other ones. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I'm not having issues with the recoil flinch. Trigger is phenomenal on this thing. Mm -hmm. The bipod is worthless for our type of shooting. Yeah. We'll get into that in a bit. But the scope itself, I, I, I had trouble with. I Quite frankly, I had trouble with. You know, when we shot the FRF1, which had... It's bipod positioning, not dissimilar to this. It was very much toward mm -hmm. uh, toward the the action and area. That's for it to not affect the barrel because it's got a nice free floated barrel. I see. So well, so I and it's got a lot of traverse. Right. So I I can understand why you would want something like that so that you do get an element or level of traverse. This, I mean, 
This feels very, very flimsy. Have you seen Have you seen shooting sticks? Are you familiar with what yes. shooting sticks yeah, are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Y, Y at the top, cross them. Yeah, and they it's, open up. Yeah. it's it's very popular for people hiking. Yes. Very popular for uh, people who are hunting long range. Yeah. Um, and it's actually for a very similar purpose. All right, all right. Allow me to demonstrate. So if I were Swiss, which I don't look at all Swiss, surprise. Okay, so I'm in the mountains in Switzerland, yeah? And uh, these pesky Germans is coming over to the borders. We up on top of the mountains, and then we look down. Boom. And then mm. we move. And then we come back to the farther end. Boom. And then we move. So allowing a much greater amount of elevational adjustment in a bipod system, mm -hmm. especially before bipods were developed to have legs that kick out yes, double their cause, length. Cause let's look at this. Can you imagine if you were running around in the mountains with something like this? Mm. So if you look at the difference between these two, this, yeah. is, this is designed for shooting prone. It's not designed for shooting with high elevation or anything No, in like fact, that. we use tripods for that nowadays. Yes. So even with the legs extended, you're just, you might barely be coming mm -hmm. close to the, the elevational adjustment that's provided by this. Yeah, so when you're talking about shooting with extreme LOS, mm -hmm. um, you're talking about an increased mobility, uh, shooting off of rocks, shooting yeah. off of strange objects. Sure. That is actually not a bad concept. Mm -hmm. I, I still wouldn't have designed it like that, but you know. As far as the concept, you could see where they're coming from. But at the from. least, that's what they're going for, right? So, the ZFK-55, what could we devise from the deployment of this rifle? Uh, first of all, I think the Swiss, and this is my opinion, I feel that the Swiss had put a rifle design before they had a concrete sniper or designated marksman doctrine, and it appears that they took elements of theory from some of the other shooting nations who had and put it into the K31 and as a result they made a rifle that was barely interchangeable with the K31 in terms of parts. They had a rifle that was quite heavy for what it was designed for and honestly not very well liked or very well deployed in the military operations that they p potentially would have been using it for. But it is an interesting example of weapons development regardless. And we are very appreciative of getting to uh, take a look at su such a rare example. There's only about 4,000 of these worldwide. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to uh, Mike and Dale over in Switzerland who helped out with the research on this uh, video and all parties who were contributing towards making this video possible. As it is a very interesting take on a rare example of a firearm. And uh, as usual, we'll see you on the range. Do you enjoy arguing with other viewers on the internet on which rifle performed better on practical accuracy? Well, we have a solution for you. Go to our Patreon page and scroll down. You'll find the Practical Accuracy Scoreboard, where we have ranked and compiled all the data of all the firearms we have tested on the Practical Accuracy course. Furthermore, it's already separated into the different categories, so you can go back to your argument as quickly as possible. And whether you decide to support us via Patreon, subscription, or just a normal viewer, we thank you.